Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wednesday Connection with Pastor Kevin Mendel coming to you from my home office here in Cleveland, Tennessee. And we welcome the Grace Community Church family and friends. Uh, this is the Passion Week. Uh, we celebrated Palm Sunday this past Sunday, and you can see that service, all of our services on uh, our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, you can access that through Facebook. Look for Grace Community Church, uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, Grace Community Church of God. And we talked about uh, that Palm Sunday was actually a fulfillment of prophecy. And it was um, uh, Jesus was headed toward uh, Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, riding on the donkey. And uh, the people thought that he was coming to deliver them from uh, the Roman government, he thought he was coming, they thought he was coming to, uh, you know, just save them from all of the problems of life that they were dealing uh, right then and there. But Jesus saw a bigger picture. We took a glimpse of that picture in Revelation 9 and 7, where there was a number of people, a number of souls in heaven from every tribe and nation from around the world, and they were waving palm branches and uh, Jesus always has a bigger picture in mind, and God is concerned with uh, getting all of the people created in his image home in heaven one day, and uh, that's what uh, our redemption uh, on the cross of Calvary by Jesus Christ is all about, and that really what was going on, because on Palm Sunday, we saw people who were waving palm branches and uh, by Friday, though, they were shaking their fists in anger. Palm Sunday, they were singing praises. On Friday, they would be uh, cursing him. And uh, Sunday, they were throwing their clothes across the animal, across the street as uh, the king was entering into town. But by Friday, they were throwing accusations uh, on uh, on Palm Sunday, they were standing with him. They wanted to be seen with him. But by Friday, the disciples are all in hiding, even denying knowing uh, him. Sunday, they were, uh, Jesus was riding on a donkey. And Friday, he would be hanging on a cross. He knew that. On Sunday, a donkey was carrying Christ. On Friday, Christ was carrying a cross. On Sunday, he touched, he healed, he ministered to people. And on Friday, the people forgot that the pain that they were in, that he delivered them from, but he's actually praying for them from the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now, this Sunday is going to be an exciting Sunday. We hope that you'll join us at 4745 Mouse Creek Road there in the family room at Grace Community Church. Our governor's relaxing uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the masks and the social distancing, all the regulations. Now, I wanted to tell you that while we are relaxing at Grace Community Church, we still have social distance seating in place. Many are still wearing masks. Some choose to not, but we are spraying things down. We are sanitizing things. We are being careful. We're, we're still not having a full choir. Uh, and, and so it's safe for you to come. I believe that. I'll be there. And uh, so I just want to encourage you in that. But, but this Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Uh, Easter Sunday. We're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday, we must not forget the events of the Passion Week. Jesus said in Luke 9, verse 22, he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and teachers of the law. And he must be killed because on the third day he will be raised again to life. We know that this final week of Jesus, he will institute the Lord's Supper. We know that there's going to be a prayer in, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
And let's just pause for a moment and think about the difference between the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Eden is where the first Adam took a fall. But the Garden of Gethsemane is where our second Adam, Jesus, took a stand. The first Garden of Eden is where God sought for Adam. The Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is seeking God. In the Garden of, of uh, Eden, Satan led Adam and Eve to a tree that leads to death. Now again, Adam and Eve were never tempted by the tree in the midst of the garden. That was a reminder of God's love. That, that tree was a reminder that everything that they needed, God had lovingly provided. But it was also forbidden by them, by, by God, for them to partake of that. And uh, because if love doesn't have a choice, it's not love at all. It would be manipulation. You would be control. And God doesn't do that. So in the first uh, uh, Garden of Eden, Satan led Adam and Eve to a tree that led to death because of their disobedience. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus would go from there to a tree that leads to eternal life. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who would rather die for us than to live without us? In fact, there's going to be a, a betrayal and arrest in that very garden. And the Bible talks about it in Luke 22. Jesus didn't uh, uh, fight that God's plan. He didn't run away from those who came to falsely accuse him and, and, and arrest him. He didn't, uh, I'll tell you what else he didn't do. He didn't make a deal with them. He knew that the wages of sin is death and that someone must pay the price. You and I couldn't do it. And Jesus was going to do that. And he said that I'll die. So he was taken and there were trials that were ramrodded and false accusations. And even Pilate himself will say, I find no fault in him. Pilate allows the people to make a choice. Here's Barabbas. He's been a murderer. He's been a thief among you. Uh, uh, and uh, but, the, but each year, you can choose someone to be released. And they said, give us Barabbas. Are you kidding me? Barabbas, who has caused harm against you. And here's Jesus, who Pilate confesses, I find no fault in him. And they say, give us Barabbas. God still loves people. Jesus' blood uh, that was shed on the cross of Calvary still has the power to forgive, to heal, to deliver, and set free. But there are many voices today who still cry, no, give us Barabbas. They just don't fully understand how much God loves them and their need for a Savior. So there's the crucifixion. And in Luke 23, all of the Gospels, you can read about the Passion of the Christ and the Crucifixion. But in Luke's account, it's in, in chapter 23. But the cross is made with two beams. One of those beams is vertical. Reaches up to heaven and touches earth. The other is horizontal. Reaching out toward uh, one another. The one, the one beam reaches up, touching heaven, and, and expresses God's love to us. The horizontal beam can represent how the Son of Man, and then we reach out to others, right? One represents the width of God's love. Someone said, how much do you love me? And Jesus spread his hands out and... Uh, and, and said, I love you this much. And yet the vertical beam reaches high uh, and, and represents the height of his holiness. The vertical beam, again, represents heaven touching earth, Jesus, the son of God. The horizontal beam represents man touching other people, uh, Jesus, the son of man. On the vertical beam, Jesus blood flowed down from his body and touched the earth. 
Our body is made from earth, right? And the cross is where God forgives sin without ever lowering his standard. The, the price of sin had to be paid for because the Bible says, we talked about this Sunday in Romans 3, 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says that the wages of that sin is death. That means that you and I, guilty of sin, are on death row. But the second part of Romans 6, 23 says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Colossians 2 verses 13 and 14 reads like this. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sin, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away by nailing it to a cross. So we thank God. You know, when the soldiers would crucify someone and when they crucified Jesus, perhaps they would put their knee uh, on the arm and they would stretch out the hand. And, and uh, we never read where Jesus had a clenched fist. I can imagine if someone was going to uh, hurt my hand that I would want to try to resist. But no, the Bible doesn't record that. He willingly stretched out his hand and his arm. And he allowed them to put the nail and drive it through his hand into a piece of wood on a cross with a hammer. It reminds me of the scripture in Isaiah that says that you and I are engraved on the palm of his hand. Did Jesus see the nail? Did he look over there and, 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 and watch as they drove that nail through his hand? Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't know, but I think that uh, no, I, I believe that you and I are engraved on the palm of his hand. He saw me and you back in the garden. Father, is it possible for this cup to pass from me? Not if we're going to redeem Kevin Mendel. Not if we're going to redeem those who are watching and listening tonight. Not if we're going to redeem whosoever will. We can't, uh, we can't not uh, uh, redeem humanity and allow you to escape this at the same time. So Jesus willingly lay down his life, right? Those hands that fed people, those hands that were moved with compassion, reaching out to touch blinded eyes and touching people and speaking life to them are now nailed to a cross. Oh, what love. Do you see that? God's love. In fact, the Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions in Isaiah 53. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. John's account in John 19, verse 1 through 4 says... Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. He beat him. We know that he was beat with 39 stripes at least. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put a purple robe on him and mockingly said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. And Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know I find no fault in him. Again, they say, give us Barabbas. Verse 17, and he, bearing his cross, went out to the place uh, called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha, where they crucified him and the two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And the sign read this, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, I don't know Pilate's motivation. I don't know if he was trying to mock Jesus or those who had falsely accused Jesus. I don't know why that sign was put there. But I know this, it is a sign of God's devotion. 
It's a symbol of God's passion to tell the world about his son. Pilate had, maybe his intention was uh, 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 intended to, to mock or to threaten. But God had another person. Purpose that every person who would see that sign could read in Hebrew, Latin, or Greek, the language of culture, Christ was declared king in all of them. Did you know he is the king of kings? He is the Lord of lords. And uh, we, we, we praise God for that. So this, this week, tonight is Wednesday night. This Friday is referred to as Good Friday because it is the day that we pause to remember that Christ went to the cross to pay for your sin and my sin and the sins of whosoever will. There's power in the blood of Jesus. And let me tell you something. Maybe you're listening tonight and you say, Pastor Kevin, after what I've done, I just don't know if God can forgive me. Let me tell you something. The cross of Christ is not about how good you and I can be or have been. No, we just read a scripture. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it is a declaration of the goodness and how great our God is. That he loves us and he would be willing to die for us. You know, you can turn in many directions. You, you can see crosses all over. I see them when I'm going down the highway. I see jewelry crosses or crosses made out of wood. They're in people's yards. They're on signs. They're in pictures. And isn't it amazing that the sign of Roman to uh, uh, torture would be a sign of life? But it is so because of Jesus. It's where God's justice and passion and forgiveness all come together. It embodies a movement of hope and of life. And it does so because of Jesus. Luke 23, verse 44 through 46. Now it was about the sixth hour. And there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands, I commit or I give my spirit. And having said this, Jesus breathed his last. Now the veil of the temple was the veil that where people would be gathered and then there was the uh, the, uh, that would be like a courtroom and then an inner chamber where the priest could go. But then there was a, a large curtain. If, if I remember the dynamics, I really didn't research that for, for tonight's teaching, but it was, it was tall enough. It was like 25 feet tall and several inches thick. And the Bible is specifically uh, calling our attention that it was torn, not from the bottom up, suggesting that man had anything to do with it but from the top to the bottom, suggesting that back in the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant would be kept, where represented the presence of Almighty God would be. And, and when Jesus shed his blood, it no longer required the blood of a sacrifice of animals. And God said as a sign that the, that the blood of Jesus was acceptable, that he tore the, the veil from the top, to the bottom, granting us access into the very presence of God. And we do so as we place our faith in Jesus Christ, the work he did on the cross, that he was buried and rose again on the third day. And today he is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding or praying for you and me. Let me tell you something. If you are away from God, the easiest thing in the world to do is to be reconciled to God because Jesus paid the price. It's already paid once and for all. We place our faith in him and God has put a measure of faith in each and every person. I don't, it doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your culture. It doesn't matter your ethnicity to each person uh, uh, created in the image of God. 
has been given a measure of faith. That is the capacity to place our faith in Jesus Christ in a God who loves us, who would rather uh, die for us than live without us. We already talked about it, but that's why this is Good Friday. We're on death row and Jesus took our place. He paid the price and that's good. But let's not forget that just as that veil was torn from the top to the bottom, Jesus' body was torn he was falsely accused, sold into the hand of sinners, ramrodded through these trials, beaten from the top of his head to, to his feet, a crown of thorns placed upon him, and then nailed to a cross. His body was broken from top to bottom. We observed communion this past Sunday. You can go back and participate in that if you'd like. Just replay that and, and, and find you a piece of bread somewhere and, and, and juice. Maybe you want to revisit that on this Good Friday and just reflect and remember that Christ allowed his body to be broken and he shed his blood. And when we partake of the bread and the juice, we remember his death. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 that we remember his death until he comes again. He is coming again. But until then, we remember that uh, agape love is not cheap. No, it costs Jesus his life. But greater love is no one than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And so for the rest of this week, and Good Friday especially, let's take time to remember that Jesus allowed himself to be beaten, betrayed, crucified, buried. And then this coming Sunday, we're going to tell the rest of the story and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we thank God for that. But until then, let's remember that your sins and my sin put Jesus on a cross and he went there willingly because God loves you and he loves me. So let's give him praise. Father, we thank you for your great love and that you reveal your love to us through the word of God, through the Holy Spirit of God, uh, and through the creation of God. And Lord, you did that so that we could be called the people of God. Father, forgive us for our sin. Forgive us where we have fallen short. Forgive us, Lord, where we treat the things of God flippantly, where we forget that sin costs you dearly and that we while we were the ones guilty jesus you took our sin you paid the price for our sin and for that we give you thanks help us to live in such a way that we honor your sacrifice and as you bring us together this past uh, this next sunday then we're going to celebrate the fact that you live and because you live we can live also we give you thanks father in christ's name amen Hey, don't forget how much God loves you. I love you. You are loved. Please consider joining us uh, this Resurrection Sunday, 10 o'clock at Grace Community Church of God right here in Cleveland, Tennessee. And uh, blessings on you. We look forward to seeing you soon. Amen.